February. Um, first off, I'd like to welcome everyone here, and I'd like to thank our sponsors for helping make this happen. So we have, I think, four sponsors today. So Smartbox, obviously for the venue, uh, Repario Recruiting for the pizza, which we'll be showing up uh, after this brief talk, and uh, Stats Counter and Hustle World, who will be covering beverages afterwards. So, without further ado, let's get to it. This is a workshop on using interfaces effectively. Now, before we get into this, I want to ask a few questions. Um, first off, just put up your hands, and by the way, just to give you all the answer, I'm going to put my hand up for every one of these. So, first off, who here uses interfaces in their job? Okay, cool. Who writes their own interfaces? Okay. Who has looked at code that is full of inter in interfaces and is an absolute nightmare? Who has written code full of interfaces that is an absolute nightmare? Okay, same number of hands. That's good to see. That's good to see. Okay, well, the reason I ask those questions is because it's related to this topic about interfaces. Interfaces are not something that dogmatically should be followed. Interfaces are a tool to be used when we need them. So that's why interfaces exist. Interfaces exist solely to make our jobs easier. If interfaces are getting in the way, then we're not using them effectively. Now, I've been there, we've all been there, we've seen people who've gone a little uh, architecture astronaut mad and added interfaces where they have no place in being because they heard interfaces are good. So the purpose of this talk and this workshop isn't just about what interfaces are, it's about how to use them effectively to make your job easier. Okay, so a little background on who I am. Uh, software architect, trainer, I basically host workshops on this. Um, I'm a little bit architecture and design mad. I'm a recovering architecture astronaut where I applied every design pattern under the sun and created some sort of design pattern Frankenstein's monster. So um, now that I have recovered, I think I am in a unique position to help people not make the mistakes I have made. Okay. So, before we get into interfaces, we're going to talk briefly about encapsulation. So, encapsulation is a software development concept that is about hiding details and exposing behavior. What we mean by that is we want to expose an interface or a functionality around something, and then we want to hide the details of how it actually does it. In this example, we have what we want to do, which is to send a letter. How we want to do it is we want to use the postal service. Pretty simple example. The idea is, is that externally, we just, if you look at the code, you would just see send letter. If you were to open it up, you would see that it's using the postal service internally. The reason this is so important <coughs> is because encapsulation is a way for us to understand concepts by removing noise. We're trying to remove the details that are irrelevant for what we're trying to do and only expose the information that actually is relevant in this case, is the behavior of sending a letter to an address. So this allows us to move into interfaces. An interface is taking encapsulation to a much more extreme level, where we have defined the behavior so strongly that it is actually explicitly its own thing. And then we have multiple things that implement that behavior. So, in one case, we have one implementation, which is deliver the letter via the Postal Service. Two, we have another, the second implementation, which is much more exciting, deliver the letter via a fleet of people on jetpacks. It will deliver the letter, it might be slightly singed, but it is a premium service and it is worth it. So the key thing here is, at runtime, if you want to send a letter, you now have the choice of whether you want to use the Postal Service, me, or jetpacks. So I'd like to introduce you to my new jetpack service, no, I'm joking. But, Based on that, I want to get across what the benefit of interfaces are. But interfaces exist solely to bring clarity to what we're trying to do. So, up on the left here, we have a standard feature in an application. You could imagine that this is a controller action. And in order to do its job, it's about somebody buying credits to get on their account. So in order to do that, they have to make a payment, update the user, and it's using all these lovely technologies that are dotted all over the place. 
If you can imagine reasoning about this and making changes to this is a bit of a nightmare. The system on the right, using interfaces, has the exact <coughs> same system as is over here, except everything is much more explicit and it's much more obvious what things are doing. We have buy credits, and in order to buy credits, you need to get a user, update their credits and save them, and you also need to make a payment. And it turns out that we have multiple ways of getting and storing users, either MySQL or Redis, and then for making payments, we are using PayPal, Agin, or Stripe. The point is that at this level, we only need to know about these two things. All these details are completely irrelevant, which makes it much easier to reason about what's going on. Okay, so that was very high level and abstract. Let's look at this in detail. Let's look at this, how this looks and actually in PHP. So here we have the interface for a message delivery service, which we have defined. It has two methods. You will deliver a message to an address, and you will also fetch a list of messages for an address. And then down here, we also have a message delivery exception, because it turns out sometimes things can go wrong. All right, so now that we've defined the interface explicitly, let's move into the implementation. In this implementation, we are using the post box. I am not showing you how this is done via Jetpacks, because that's proprietary to me, and you're not getting it. But here we are using a postbox service. You can see it being included up here. It implements the message delivery interface, which means you have to have both the methods deliver and fetch. Internally, you can see that it is trying to create a new letter, which is a post office concept. It doesn't exist elsewhere. And then it tries to post it. And then it is also possible that you could get a full exception, because you know sometimes post boxes are full. Happens. When that's the case, you turn it into the general purpose exception for something went wrong trying to deliver this message. Now, what's interesting about this is if you look at it, from this level, the language is all around delivering a message. There are no details, there's no mess anything to do with post office or anything like that. When you get into the implementation, this is the only place you should see implementation language. This is uh, how you know you've gotten your encapsulation correct. The language of this subdomain, or you know, domain-specific language, hasn't bled into your application. So it's all about gaining clarity. Okay, so now that we have defined the interface and we've created an implementation, we have to bind it. Now, what this actually means is that we're trying to figure out any time that this interface is requested by the application, give it this concrete implementation. So if you guys heard of, who here uses auto-wiring and dependency injection? All right, cool. So for those of us who don't, um, it is a way of telling your application that build this object, and what it will do is it will go through the dependency tree of all the inputs in the constructor, like we have here, and it will attempt to instantiate them and inject it in. And anywhere that it comes across an interface, it will figure out which implementation of the interface to use and inject that in. So what this means is that you can have a ridiculously long tree of objects, but you just give it to the dependency of the, the container system, and it'll instantiate that entire tree and just give you back the object. So this makes it much easier to reason about. It just means that you don't have to constantly create these objects and pass them in everywhere you need it. You just bind it in one location and the system will take care of the rest. So in this example, if we are in the testing environment, bind a singleton, which means only use, just repeat the instance. If you need the message delivery class, well, just use the fake version because we don't care. Now, what this means is that if you're only if you're testing the application in acceptance tests, we don't actually want to connect to an external API or anything like that. Just fake it. It's cool. We don't care. Um, if you're not in testing, if you're in local staging production, we want to use the post box implementation. And you'll notice here we're actually wrapping it in a message delivery timer. That also implements the interface, but what that's doing is it's decorating the behavior and timing how long it takes to send the letter. So that's a little advanced, but it's, I wanted to, to get that in, that interfaces give you a lot of flexibility. So decisions, decisions. <laughs> when it comes to either binding an interface or injecting an interface or whatever way you want to call it, there are really two problems. One is when you're binding based on the environment variables, such as are we in production, um, or based on certain config variables that have been set at the time of release. In this case, you should use binding. But other times, you're going to want to change implementation based on user data. Basically, you know, somebody has sent data to your HTTP endpoint, 
and they said they want to pay with PayPal instead of Adyen. In that case, you are changing behavior. Now, if you're doing that, what you should do is have a factory for creating the instance, give it the variable that's the deciding factor, and that will give you the implementation that you need, and then pass that through to the next thing that does the work. Now, that's called normally the strategy pattern, but the idea is that you don't have to bind it at runtime, it's just most of the time you implement services, which is what I call these, you will. But you also have the freedom that if there's user data, you can get it when you need it. Okay, so with all this talk, we've defined the interface, we've defined the implementation, now we've defined it, how do you actually use it? Well, this is pretty simple. We have a message delivery controller. And inside here, in the constructor, you can see we're passing through the message delivery service, and then we just associate it. And then down here, message deliver message address. That's it. And if you are using Laravel or anything that has auto wiring, you don't have to push this in or write any code to actually inject this. If you've done the binding here, it'll just take care of it for you. So it's very easy to use. All right, now this one's a little more advanced and I would stress uh, this workshop is intended to be a day long, if not more workshop. So this is a condensed version. However, I'm still gonna go we'll give everyone an overview of these concepts because I want you guys to see that there's a lot to this but it offers a lot of opportunity to uh, build more stable software. So here we have integration tests. So in this case, an integration test is, we have this interface, how do we make sure it behaves the way we expect? Now what we actually mean by this is what is the contract of the interface? Like for example, if you add a letter to the, delivery, uh, to the message delivery service, you add a message to it to an address, and then you fetch that, what happens if you fetch it again? Should it be blank? Should it get the same list? It's all about trying to understand the behavior. Now, the interesting thing about interfaces is, regardless of the implementation, every single one of them should behave the exact same way. So in that case, when you're defining an integration test, all you're testing is the external behavior, nothing to do with the internals, which is why you create what I would like you call integration tests or contract tests or whatever people want to call them, that uh, you create an abstract test class that it's just a message delivery test, and inside it, it will have methods to test the contracts, to test the behavior. And you can see here, absolutely no details of how it's doing the work are mentioned, because it's actually irrelevant. Now, when it comes to testing the concrete implementation, so either the Postbox or Jetpack version, in these cases, you would just extend this, and then implement this method, and return your concrete implementation. So this means that you can have as many versions as you like, but you don't have to worry about constantly rewriting the test for it. This one test will pretty much make sure that they all behave the exact same way. Okay, so one thing I really wanted to talk about here is about when to use interfaces. Because if you're coming from Golang or even Java or various other languages, the status quo or C Sharp, I think, is pretty bad for this as well. Um, interfaces, interfaces everywhere. And it ends up that every implementation has an interface, and it just becomes an absolute nightmare to navigate that code. I do not subscribe to that philosophy at all. My philosophy is the only time you should have interfaces is when you have two things that have the same behavior, but do it differently in the same code base at the same time. It's the only time you should use interfaces. If you don't, then the interfaces, you're, you're just over-designing, you're over-architecting. If you, need, you know you're going to need it later, you can do it later. So I'll just give some examples of when you might do this. One is you want to change behavior based on the value. So the example I gave earlier about PayPal, Agen, Stripe, that's changing behavior based on a value. You want to change, sorry, the implementation, how it does things under the hood. So in that case, interfaces make sense. These things all behave, all have the same external behavior, but they do things differently internally. Uh, another one, you want to change technologies or libraries. So what I mean by that is, that you want to change how you're connecting to an API, you want to change how you're storing your information, and you want to make this hot swappable, or you want to run both at once. I'll give you an example, switching from MySQL to Redis, you're not going to just do the swap like that, you're going to run both of them side by side to make sure they actually work, and that one is mirroring the behavior of another, there's sort of a change over period, so interfaces make sense. You would create a MySQL implementation, and a Redis implementation, run them side by side. Uh, another one, which I uh, was talking to somebody at the software craftsmanship meetup about this, uh, the acceptance tests in his system were incredibly slow. 
So an acceptance test is test the system a feature all the way through using as much real infrastructure as you could. So what happened is, is that he was hitting an external API that was incredibly slow. So the systems were taking 30 minutes to run all the tests. That's, that's a bit of a disaster. It kind of it makes the tests redundant because nobody will use them. So what you do there is that you would create a fake implementation of the thing that's slowing it down and use that in the acceptance test and then have one integration test that makes sure it actually behaves as expected. So to give an example of that, that means that you would use a fake version of this API that just gives the thumbs up and moves on and then you would have just one test elsewhere that makes sure you actually can connect to that API. So this allows you to speed up your acceptance test while still proving that your system works as expected. So this is one that I uh, really wanted to get into. Uh, seeing the forest for the trees. So most of the time, when people talk about interfaces of design, it's always a greenfield project starting it from the ground up, and you know, I can think about this so clearly, et cetera, et cetera. That's because it was prepared for a presentation and isn't real live code, which is usually a sea of confusion and details. So this is about how do you take an existing system and extra figure out if there are interfaces in there and how to extract them out. So the first step is encapsulate. Before you can create interfaces, you have to encapsulate uh, details and expose behavior. So usually the way I would do this is categorize the code as either intent or implementation. So what I mean by this is look at the code and say what is our intent here? And the intent is we want to save the user. Okay, how is it doing this? The implementation is it's using Eloquent from Laravel or it's using some other ORM. So figure out what is an implementation detail versus what is an intent detail. Second, move all the implementation details into intent named private methods. In this case, create a private method that would be fetch user and another one store user and inside that use the eloquent or ORM language. Next, now that you've got all these private methods and you've done a pass through and done all this, you can now extract out uh, a class that has this behavior as public methods and inject that in. So what this means now is that you've taken one messy class and you've just split it into two less messy classes. So once you have that, and if you've got that, what you should do is then look at the class you've extracted, look at it internally, and try to figure out, first off, is its behavior changing on some sort of piece of data, either an environment variable or a piece of data that's being passed in? Uh, or is it using multiple technologies that seems to switch between them? Now, if it's doing neither of those, you should just stop there because you don't need interfaces, you just have something you've encapsulated. But if you find out it does have this, this means that you have two interfaces, you have two or more implementations merged together, so you should try to extract those out. So first off, extract an interface from that implementation. Second, figure out, extract out the actual implementations into their own subclasses. And then figure out how you want to bind them. Do you bind them at runtime? or do you find them based on input? But this is pretty much how I would go through something messy and try to figure out if there are interfaces to extract and then trying to figure out how to extract them. Okay, so we've kind of talked very abstract. We had the world's dumbest message delivery interface. Uh, the real world is a little more messy. So we're going to go through some examples that are actually, some of them are you probably use day to day and are part of the PSR standards. So, number one. PSR3, which is the logger interface. So PSR3 is a standard interface for how we represent loggers in our system. So first off, who, who here uses PSR3? Or should I ask, who here uses monolog? Okay, there you go. Part of the reason monolog is so useful is because it implements this interface. And it means that you can swap out any implementation of the, of uh, the logger for any other implementation that implements this, and it'll just work. Very little config, no, no mess. You can see here it's actually pretty standard. And by the way, hint, hint, this is important for the workshop. So another one, and this isn't important for the workshop, but it's important to go through it. The fly systems, this is a really interesting library that is an abstraction on top of file systems. So this means that you can use a multitude of file systems, be it in memory, local file system, remote FTP, uh, S3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is a unified interface that allows you to access multiple implementations, but at the level of this interface, you don't care about any of those details, it all behaves the exact same way. 
This makes it much easier to reason about uploading files. It allows you to hide all the messy details elsewhere. Okay, so let's talk about the workshop we're all going to jump into now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an existing Laravel 5.5 app, didn't have time to get 5.6, and we are going to solve some problems where the answer is always an interface, all right, or a combination of interfaces. So the process for this and what I would like people to do is doing this individually, you might, uh, it's going to be a lot of work to do it individually, and also if you are going to design interfaces, you're never going to do it by yourself, you're going to do it collaboratively, collaboratively. So I would like people to break into groups, said four to five, but really three to five. Just split off into groups, it's part of the reason we have the name tags, and figure out, well first off, we're gonna spend 15 minutes getting to know each other after this. Uh, the pizza will arrive shortly after that. And then we're gonna set up the, work, uh, the workshop code base, and we're gonna choose a challenge to complete as a team. And I am going to be wandering around this, uh, and you can ask me any questions you like. And one thing I'd like to stress about this, there is no right way to do this. There are just better ways to do it. And the better ways just means that it's easier to make the changes you want to make without adding extra noise to the code. So I wouldn't worry about this, just have fun with it. This is about exploring interfaces and seeing what we can achieve. So there are three challenges. And they start off easy, medium, hard. The first one is pretty simple. We are going to first take a very naive implementation of PSR3, or should I say no implementation of it, so we've just got code that's literally writing to a file. So what we're going to do is take that, <coughs> we are going to take it from the request logger middleware, we're going to wrap it in a PSR3 uh, interface, bind that, and then just prove it works. And then afterwards, swap it out for a monologue implementation. So if you can do that, you're using interfaces effectively and taking your your implicit in implementation, making it explicit with an interface, and then swapping it out. So effectively, you're making your uh, code more modular. So challenge two, intermediates. This one is based on the example I was talking about, about a slow API. So as part of our home page in this app, it displays a inspirational quote, because everyone loves those on websites. And to do this, it is hitting an API. Sadly, this API is incredibly slow, or at least we're going to pretend it is. And as such, we do not want to use it in our acceptance tests. So, what do we do? We are going to extract it out into its own interface. We are going to create two implementations. One is a fake one, one is the real one, and then we are going to use which one, figure out which one to use depending on the environment variable, uh, which is the app env. And one of the things is that currently it's caching it as a bit of an extra challenge and fun on this. Uh, try making the caching easy to turn on or off for the response from this API in the real implementation. Now, one thing I would stress with this, we don't really have time for everyone to write integration tests and for everything here, and that's okay. We don't really have the time for it. If you want to, feel free to do it, but otherwise just stick to the acceptance tests that have already been defined. They will at least allow you to, to work with this. All right, so hard mode. Uh, this is for the people that really want to challenge. So for this one, we have a context list in admin, the administration panel. People have this context list, and it is constantly getting hammered, or at least we're going to use make-believe to pretend it is. So as that's the problem, what we want to do is we want to switch it to a caching system that is going to do it much faster, because realistically, people are just constantly refreshing and looking at this list, just cache it, it doesn't need to hit the DB. Now, the thing is, we don't know which caching implementation is best. There's been a big argument in the dev team, so we've decided to implement both. So what we're going to do, and that, that happens more often than anything. So, write a cache in both Redis and the file system. That's the first step. Second, make it easy to switch one for the other. Two, three, time how fast each cache is. So, the thing is, is that if we really want to know which one's best, we need to time them. Now, I would say for this, for the timing, you can be, just be as lazy as possible, just you know, write to a log maybe, like challenge one. Maybe see how that goes. Um, we want also want to make, to make it easy to enable or disable the timer for this. And uh, finally, this is a hint. Uh, you want to clear the cache whenever a user is saved. Now, the reason I say that 
is because the cache is useless if it doesn't return the data that's live. So anytime you store a user, you just clear the cache. It's nice and easy. By the way, expect Eloquent to get in the way here. Eloquent is not really intended to uh, be used with interfaces to swap out implementation. It is tightly coupled database logic with model logic, business logic, kind of just mush together. And if you're trying to do this kind of extraction, it is going to get in the way. Um, and just so you guys know, I have done all three of these challenges, so I just haven't made these up and said good luck. And also, I have not pushed the code, though, so I will do that afterwards, but uh, no, no, no cheating, okay? So, getting started. How do we get started in this workshop? First thing we're going to do, you need to get a computer. I thankfully see a lot of them here, so step one, stage one, I think, is a, is a success. Next, we um, go to this URL. I have a GitHub repo that has all the code you need to get started. Um, follow the instructions to install it, and then choose a challenge and get to it. And one of the things I'd say about this is, if you guys saw on the original site, we on uh, the meetup page, we've requested, requested that people have Docker installed. Uh, if you do have Docker installed, there are some very simple instructions on this repo on how to get up, uh, get set up. You can find them if you just look at the README, or if you go to, I think it's install, install hyphen docker md on that repo. Okay, so before we get to the actual workshop, uh, let's open up the floor to some questions and answers. And uh, yeah, once we've uh, completed that, I think that we can split off into groups and figure out how we uh, want to do this. So let's let's get to the questions. Who's question? Memory leaks. Sorry? Memory leaks. What about them? Yeah, what about them? How many do you have in PHP? How many do I have in PHP? I, I, I stopped counting. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, like, the question generally is because my background is C++, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't have interfaces in C++, it's all abstract with your classes. Mm -hmm. So the question here is, if I do it in, in, in C++, you know, I generally, like, so if, if we create an interface, what you guys call interfaces, mm -hmm then, you know, it tends to be, you know, consuming at least two CPU cycles to do this. So I'm thinking in PHP, that must be the same thing, or in Java or in C Sharp, mm -hmm. because everybody hates it in C Sharp, I think. You know, so is that not a problem? Like, you know, in general, like, you know, you're, you're consuming more CPU power just for the sake of making things easier? I understand why you want them, mm -hmm. right? Makes total sense. It's just a question, you know, like, have you ever had, like, big problems with, with you know, like, uh, nothing like that. I mean, one of the things about PHP is that it's intended to live for a very short life cycle. So every request spins up a new world, does the work, and then destroys that world. Yeah, so if for, for with PHP, you rarely notice any problems with this. And usually in PHP, if you, with a PHP application, if you have slowdown or problems, Usually it's nothing to do with like CPU cycles or anything like that, or memory usage. Usually the problem is you making a ridiculous number of database calls. Uh, it's always the network calls that slow you down in PHP. So uh, yeah, so just look at those first, then you, can, then you can figure out if you can get more out of it. And if it's really a problem, I, should, I would switch to another language, to be honest, but you're probably not gonna see any of those problems. All right, cool, cool. Well, does anyone have any questions about the challenges? Anything that isn't clear or any. Uh, sure how, how do you find uh, two types of objects to the same interface? Okay. Actually, what uh, our aim uh, just bring uh, the class if you implement one interface, one class implements one interface. If, if you have two, mm -hmm. actually, it doesn't know. It. Well, that would be in the binding slide. So if we go back to this. You can see here that we're saying that singleton. If you ask for this interface, give this concrete implementation. So, but down here you see we have another implementation, and it is yeah. yeah. And if, uh, but there you have two different uh, environments. Mm -hmm. Yes. But if you receive the, you need to receive two files to implement the same stuff. Okay. So you're saying that if you, uh, can you give me an example of that? Uh, like you could receive two kinds of of uh, delivery message delivery. Okay, well, if that's yeah. the, okay. Well, if you've got a system like that and you need to pass two versions, interfaces probably aren't the right answer for that. Because realistically, no, you should. it's the answer. It's the answer, <laughs> okay. Well, I would need to know more about your circumstance in order to answer that.
stuff, but maybe we could have chat about that during the workshop. Because okay. uh, it's pretty hard to figure that out. Like, in, my gut answer for this is use factories rather than binding at uh, launch time. But uh, yeah, I'll need to discuss further and understand it. Um, any any other questions? Oh, I uh, really didn't read about bringing a laptop. Oh, that, that's that's okay. That's yeah, okay. I'm trying to, to get some remote access to my computer. Oh no! What like what what I would say is is just uh, yeah. Yeah. team up with somebody team team up with somebody else's computer. Yeah. One of the things I would say with this guys is if everyone here is trying to implement this, it might not work. So feel free that if you're in a group, one person, two people, whatever you feel comfortable with. But not everyone needs to actually be writing this code. You can just join in with a group. If there are any juniors here, um, just join up with a group of other people, maybe seniors, and see how they do it. Just join in and learn from the experience. If there are any seniors here, and there are juniors in the group, try to coach people, try to bring it forward, because it's, it's a collaborative experience. Uh, one of the things about interfaces is it's, is it's about expressing intent. So if you're not able to communicate, you're probably not going to be able to use interfaces. So uh, <laughs> just just being just being honest there. Okay. Well, so guys, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, yeah, let's let's get to it. Let's go outside and uh, network and such. Thank you. sitting there, work away, but uh, whatever you prefer. Okay. And I'm just going to leave up the final slide. There we are. So you guys can get that. Uh, yes, uh, Bruno has the uh, He's written it down on a post-it. Uh, Bruno there in the green shirt. So he'll be able to uh, in the glasses and the green top. He'll be able to do that.